Hey, everybody. Hey, it's Todd. Uh, we think so. We think so. We think so. Um, it is six oh four in the evening. It is uh, April fourth. I'm Mike Capuano. I'm pla uh, chair of the planning board. With me tonight is uh, Joe Favaloro, Dr. Kelly Gay, and Jerry Amaral. Um, it's my understanding that we will also have our new, uh, newly sworn in member who may be joining us tonight, um, Lydia Aboff. Uh, she seems to be running a little late, but when she comes in, I'll have her um, introduce herself to all of you and to us. Um, we have a number of items on the agenda that have been continued. Uh, one is 346 Somerville Avenue, which was voted to be continued to May 2nd, and that is still continued to May 2nd. 176 to 182 Broadway, uh, which was previously continued to April 18th. 300 Somerville Avenue, which was previously continued to April 18th. Uh, we have a new case, 10 to 50 Prospect Street. Do we have a legal notice for that? We do. Could I... Uh, Ask the clerk to read that along with the other new case that will be heard, uh, 10, 10 Prospect Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is a legal notice for a public hearing. A public hearing for all interested parties will be held by the planning board on Thursday, the 4th of April at 6 p.m. on the third floor community room, visiting nurse association, 259 Lower Street, Southern Vermont. The case is before us at 1050 Prospect Street, Planning Board 2019-03, Applicant Union Square, RELP, Master Developer, LLC, and owners, the City of Somerville and the Somerville Redevelopment Authority, seek design and site plan review on the Somerville Zoning Ordinance Section 5.4 and Section, section Somerville Zoning Ordinance Section 6.8 to create an alley on Block B2 as identified in the Union Square Revitalization Plan in the Union Square Neighborhood Plan. As proposed in the previously approved Coordinated Development Special Permit, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Chairman, TOD 100 and CCD 55-C, underlying Zoning District, Union Square Overlay District, and CC 7, HR, and MR 4 Subdistricts Ward 2. The other case is 10 Prospect Street, Planning Board 2019-04. Applicant Union Square, RELP, Master Developer, LLC, and owners the City of Somerville and the Somerville Redevelopment Authority. Seek design and site plan review on the Somerville Zoning Ordinance Section 5.4, and Somerville Zoning Ordinance Section 6.8 to construct a commercial building on Block B2 as identified in the Union Square Revitalization Plan and the Union Square Neighborhood Plan. As proposed in the previously approved Coordinated Development Special Permit, POB 100 underlying zoning district. Union Square Overlay District and CC7 Subdistrict 1. Submittals may be viewed in person in the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development, located on the third floor of City Hall, 93 Highland Ave, Southern Mass, Monday to Wednesday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m., Thursday, 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. As cases may be continued to later dates, please check the agenda on the City's website or call before attending the meeting. Continued cases will not be re-advertised. Interest per interested persons may provide comments to the planning board at the hearing or by submitting written comments by mail to OSPCD, Planning Division, 93 Highland, Summer of Mass, Local 143, BAP 617-625-0722, or by email to planning at summerofomass.gov. Attest Michael Capilano, Chairman, as was published in the Summerville Times on 320 and 327 19. Thank you, Joe. We have a request to continue 10 to 50 Prospect Street, which is Planning Board Case 2019-3 uh, to April 18th. Uh, the chair moved to continue that case Thank to you. April 18th, seconded by Joe. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The only case that will be heard tonight uh, is 10 Prospect Street, which is Planning Board Case 2019-4. Um, does George Proakis have a couple of things he wants to say? I, I heard it was three sentences and then I'm real close to the I'm, I'm, I'm three sentences. That's quite a, <laughs> quite a sales pitch there for me, as By you know. Way, welcome back. We miss you. Thank you. Uh, and I miss you as well. Um, George Proakis, Executive Director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. Um, in the time that uh, I have been uh, 
executive director and not planning director since November. I haven't had a chance to spend as much time with all of you, so uh, thank you. Um, I also want to make sure you have a chance to uh, introduce your new board member as we uh, get started on a, um, into the first of our uh, cases. Amelia, welcome. Thank you. So, and and uh, thank you all to the members of the planning board this evening for being here. Um, I just wanted to provide a brief bit of background before I have to run back to City Hall for yet another meeting, um, visiting the Legislative Matters Committee this evening, um, of where we stand with the project in Union Square. Um, as many of you are aware, and I believe as the four of you who are not newcomers here were, were around when we did it, in um, December of 2017, you voted the coordinated development special permit for the Union Square D blocks, which was based upon zoning that had been discussed by the planning board and by the Board of Aldermen prior to that. Um, with that special permit in place, the role of the master developer is to move individual projects through the review process in front of your board. Um, there are a couple of uh, issues and, and concerns related to that. Certainly, uh, as each project is done, it's supposed to be done through design and site plan review process. It's also supposed to be done in a circumstance that allows you to look at the coordinated development special permit and understand whether or not that and the conditions related to it are all being followed, they're being followed appropriately. Um, as you may recall, at that point in time, we had some discussion about open space on blocks D1 and D7. We're still working on some strategies on open space on block D7. That's not before you tonight. Um, before you tonight is a portion of block D2. Uh, I know a couple of weeks before ago, you had before you a subdivision of lots to create the block D2.1 lot, which is now the one in front of you as, as this opens. Uh, meanwhile, there continue to be some discussions in the community. Um, I had an opportunity to present at a meeting with uh, Union Square community members a few weeks ago about um, some other options on the D2 design um, in an effort to provide underground parking and more open space. Uh, we continue to find some cost challenges to that, but um, as a follow-up to that meeting, that was a meeting where I had put out a whole lot of information on where we stood. Um, I've asked for a couple of steps to go forward to see where we can go with that process. Um, one is, uh, since the information that had come back from our independent peer reviewer on the cost of this alternate design had not yet been run through some more nuanced numbers with US2, I gave those numbers back to US2 to take a look at. Um, they have then taken a look at those and they have now provided those numbers back and we have provided to us and we're providing them back to our peer reviewer to take another scrub through to see what it actually would cost to do the two alternative plans. Um, when we were talking um, in front of the community that day, we're talking about one of them being in the range of 20 plus million dollars more and the other about 10 million dollars more. Um, the US2 estimates have the second one more like 16 million more. I want our peer reviewer to look at that number. Um, after we have figured out what that is, we want to pass that off to some of our consultants who have done independent reviews of the economic impact of some of these before and figure out whether or not that is a cost that a developer in this sort of situation can bear. And also continue to have a conversation about some of the pros and cons of those design differences. That, that said, um, at the same time, the applicant has filed an application to continue to move forward with the project as was approved in the CDSP. And we are, we are beginning the process of evaluating those applications. Um, Dan and uh, Alex from the planning division team are assigned the role of case review planners for this particular project to see it through the review process, make sure it's consistent with our regulations, with the coordinated development special permit, and with all of the steps necessary in order to be before your board and, and have your board take action on a design and site plan review for it. So um, with their preparation and their uh, submittal of this plan, um, we're excited to have before you a commercial office lab type building, essentially a, 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 uh, the first significant lab building in Somerville, something we've talked about for a long time as a goal and a priority of the city, um, before you tonight for your review. Uh, but being that there are two things going on, one is uh, the completion of the details of this application and the planning department's recommendation on it, and the second, the conversations ongoing about um, the underground parking plan. Um, the staff is not in a position tonight where we're asking your board to take a vote on it. So as you'll see, you don't have a staff recommendation in front of you. At one point in time, we were thinking of providing even the beginnings of one, but our, 
Our staff wasn't in a position yet even ready to do that. What we thought was most appropriate was to have the applicant have a chance to present to you and the public where they are, uh, have a chance to take testimony tonight, um, and at that point to uh, see where we all stand. Um, as has been the policy of this board, um, as you know, um, we will continue to take testimony as the planning staff provides more information to you. So, you know, once we provide our recommendation and conditions, um, it's not like public comment is closed. The public will have another <coughs> shot at a comment on those recommendations and where we stand on it. Um, but at this moment in time tonight, it is a chance uh, to hear from the applicant as to what they've been doing and how they've been working on this first building, D2.1, and uh, to hear from the public on uh, their thoughts on D2.1 uh, and and uh, what it may mean for our city. So. Um, uh, excited to have the opportunity to have that in front of you. There's still a lot of work and a lot of pieces and a lot of things going on ahead of us. I just want to keep you updated on that and where we are with it. Um, I do hope that in the coming weeks I will have more information on what's going on with the with the, the, the differing designs for the D2 site. Um, but um, today a chance to uh, reflect on the possibility of putting a, a pretty significant new addition to Union Square that is uh, something we've been talking about since the Union Square plan era. I think it's a good opportunity to move ourselves a little bit forward and keep the conversation going. That's all I have. If you have questions specific to me, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm happy to jump on to my other meeting and uh, let you move forward. All right, well, <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'd like to make a very brief introduction. Uh, new member, we can just briefly introduce yourself and we'll introduce ourselves as well because I don't know if you've actually formally met all of us yet. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm sorry to have been a moment late. My name is Amelia Abob. Um, I'm an urban planner and real estate project manager uh, for the Union Square Project Management Team. Um, I've been in some roles for about a year now. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the Uh, my name is Dorothy Kennedy, and I've been on the board for about three and a half years. And Dorothy was a former mayor of Albany as well. I'm Mike Capuano, I'm the chair. Um, I've been on the planning board since 2008. Um, in my real life, I'm a lawyer. I'm Joe Favaloro. I've had the pleasure to be uh, a school committee person in Albany, and I'm a member of the planning board for 23 years. Uh, Jerry, thanks, Sean, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Jerry Amaral, I've been on the board for six, seven years now. I'm a member of, I mean, a owner of a business in the city, and welcome aboard. Thank you very much. So, um, for everybody here, the way I think this evening is going to go, we're going to have a presentation by the applicant. As George explained, um, there is no staff report yet. Uh, there's still a lot of information that we need. Uh, the staff, I expect, will be providing us with at least a preliminary report by our April 18th meeting. Um, I want to just make it clear to everybody in, in the room, I know George kind of hinted at it, even if we had a staff report tonight, um, this is such a major step forward in the development um, of Union Square that there's no way that this board would have taken the vote tonight. Um, we always try our best to take as much of your testimony into our consideration to try to move the applicant forward to a, 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 a place where um, folks can, can be happy with a, with a project before we, uh, to the best of our ability, before we can move forward um, with it. So that in mind, after the applicant makes a, a presentation of where they stand now, I'm going to ask for anyone who wants to give uh, testimony to do so. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this project, having reviewed this when we got it, but I'm going to hold off on my thoughts and comments until we hear from you because honestly it might overlap and um, we get paid to be here and you have other places to be. Um, I'd rather hear from you first. Um, the staff will then hopefully come to us with a preliminary recommendation by our April 18th meeting, um, which is, I think, two, or two weeks from now-ish. We're probably going to hold the written comment open so that you can, if, you, if you're not here, if your friends and neighbors can't make it here, uh, submit written comment through uh, noon on 
Friday, April 19th. And so I think the very earliest this board will take up this um, project for any kind of a vote would be uh, the May 2nd meeting. Um, and I think that might be the earliest we would take it up because we probably have a lot more to say and, and, and more to work with the applicant on depending on where the written comment comes out and if the staff has an amended uh, report for us by the May 2nd meeting, if it substantially changes the nature of this project, uh, you all will have the opportunity to provide more public testimony so we can try to um, make this project something that uh, we can strongly support and that the neighborhood supports, that we support as a board. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major step forward. It is obviously right in the heart of Union Square, so it's an impactful building, um, more than some others that may come down the pike. So um, that being the case, I'd like to welcome the applicant up to make a presentation to see where where you are off. Yes, Jerry. I've been able to recuse myself in this process. Yep, uh, Jerry has to recuse himself. So, per, uh, per request of the city's legal department, I'll be recusing myself for the whole Union Square process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I know that you requested to you still have a nice full form here, so we're good to go. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. My name is Greg Karczewski. I'm the president of US2. We're the applicant for the project. Um, we're the designated master developer for the Union Square Revitalization Plan. Um, and we're, you know, been working with the community, the city, um, and all the stakeholders in Union Square since our selection back in, in 2014. And uh, I've gone through a number of steps to get to this point today and appreciate everybody's um, collaboration getting to this point. It is an important step forward. We're talking about the, the very first commercial building in Union Square, which, you know, in the very first conversation I had about this project was presented as one of the major objectives. So we're excited to share our progress. I'd like to introduce John Sullivan from SGA Architecture, who's here, who's going to walk through a short presentation, and then we, we look forward to hearing from, uh, from the folks in the audience. Thank you. <coughs> My name is John Sullivan. I'm an architect with SGA. Very uh, honored and excited to be here tonight to present uh, you know, this, this major milestone for uh, Parcel D2.1. In the context of the subdivision plan, we thought we would introduce uh, Parcel D2.1 now uh, being referred to as 10 Prospect Street. George uh, mentioned the subdivision plan, which the board has seen. Um, and we just wanted to highlight the, the project metrics um, as a commercial building focused on lab, office, and uh, research use. 178,000 square feet approximately, uh, over seven levels. Uh, 12,000 square feet of ground floor retail, uh, just under uh, 9,000 square feet of creative arts and uh, inter creative enterprise and arts use, um, and then 158,000 square feet approximately of, of lab, office, or research use. So we're very excited by the, the use mix in the building. <laughs> This project, um, as we've all discussed, has just been rooted in um, a comprehensive planning co uh, process uh, since 2002, and we felt like it was very, you know, it may be helpful at this point since this is the first, uh, you know, project to come before uh, before you as, as the first, you know, building from the master plan to highlight some of that process and just identify where we are now. And of course, it all started with with Summer Vision in 2002, which really laid out, you know, the city's first comprehensive master plan. Um, and, and goals for, uh, you know, for the, the city to, to focus on opportunity areas and to transform those areas into uh, mixed-use, uh, transit-oriented, you know, vibrant uh, parts of the city. Is that better? Yes. Start over? Um, so, so Summer Vision is, is where it all started in, in, in 2002, and, and from that, um, and, and those goals that were identified um, came the revitalization plan also in 2002, which um, provided a mechanism for, uh, you know, for the D blocks in particular to be developed um, and to designate a master developer uh, to lead the process forward, you know, with, with the community. From that uh, came the, uh, the neighborhood plan uh, in, in 2015. Um, which just put a finer point on Union Square as a neighborhood and really what, what the appropriate response was, you know, for this neighborhood specifically. Um, we feel like as, in the context of our building, it defined what should happen, you know, commercial use, what should happen on parcel D2.1. 
two years later as we transition to the, uh, to the uh, Union Square uh, zoning overhaul, uh, specifically for, for this neighborhood, um, you know, this defined <coughs> Uh, requirements that need to happen to, to, to see this through so this uh, you know ultimately defined this building as a, a seven-story you know commercial building um, and, and had you know a series of thoughtful requirements and design guidelines that we will be presenting tonight um, and that informed the uh, the um, coordinated development special permit uh, which has been approved um, and which was approved in, in 2018 so that all set up the uh, you know the groundwork to for us to start the um, design and site plan review process, which is which is where we are now. Um, so within that process, which um, you know has been a very collaborative uh, process over the past 16 months with the with the community and with the Somerville planning staff, um, you know we are now uh, at the point where we're excited to present you know what we think is a very thoughtful vision to the board. We've had multiple uh, neighborhood meetings. Um, we've had multiple conversations with the design review committee. And we've submitted a, a you know what we think is a very thorough application that um, highlights you know uh, compliance with zoning, uh, adhering to uh, you know again what is a thoughtful series of design guidelines, and what we think is a is a, is a really exciting response for for this site. So we're we're excited to be in this this moment. It represents um, you know an important an important milestone. With that said, there are a couple of uh, things that. Um, you know, came out of that process that have informed the design that you'll see tonight that we feel very strongly about. Um, the first, uh, the first one being, you know, uh, focus on the public realm uh, uses at the ground at the ground level of this building that really uh, provide activation, uh, retail, um, and focus on the pedestrian experience. Uh, you know, we've also thought a lot about um, view corridors and how this building integrates with uh, the historic landmarks in Union Square, the post office building views to uh, Prospect Hill Monument, um, views to the former fire station, um, and then the relationship with Union Square Plaza, how the corner of this building reacts. It's a, it's a signature, uh, it's, a, it's a visual marker, it's an important moment um, in, in, the, in Union Square, but also it's a, it's, a, it's a part of the building that needs to you know, defer to the importance of Union Square Plaza, so we're, we're excited by that opportunity. And then lastly, you know, understanding that this is the, uh, you know, one of the first commercial buildings, seven stories, uh, you know, 178,000 square feet, really important to break the massing down in, in ways that we will explain, to have it feel comfortable, to have it feel appropriate to the different edge conditions, um, and again, to really foster uh, a, um, a strong pedestrian experience at, at the, uh, you know, at that scale, and also, you know, the appropriate urban response at the, at the city scale. So these are, these are principles that have guided our design. Um, again, uh, you know, D2.1 as the first commercial building in Somerville, we were really inspired by that as, you know, as the building's purpose. We thought a lot about the history, we thought a lot about, you know, Union Square's first um, name as Sandpit Square, where the silica in the, in the sand was used to, um, you know, uh, to, to promote industry, glass making, brick making, uh, you know, adjacent industries as related to producing metal, tubing. Um, so we were really excited by that, and that was in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, when, when there was transit in Union Square, and, and, and really where, that, where Union Square was the city's economic engine. You know, we see this as that same opportunity uh, to introduce you know, the innovation economy to, you know, to, to what is already a, a thriving and diverse neighborhood. Research, creative arts, you know, office use technology, um, you know, we just see this as a transformative, uh, you know, piece to this, to this puzzle. So we're, we're really excited by that opportunity. I think as it reflects itself in our design, um, you know, paying homage to that history was, was very important to us. And we felt like, you know, through the way the building was articulated, through some of the material selection, you know, we had an opportunity to create a, you know, a modern forward looking thinking for, you know, for again, a, a very, you know, vibrant and forward looking community. Um, you know, for, for innovative and research uh, users, um, but that's really an interpretation of the industrial vernacular. So we're, we're excited to use some materials that, uh, materials and, and um, uh, design articulation that, that really pay respect to that. Starting at the ground level, um, you know, it's very important to us uh, to, you know, really think about the site's edges along Prospect Street um, and along Somerville Avenue in particular, where we've oriented our retail. We have about 12,000 square feet of retail at this ground level. Active edges uh, along those two streets and turning a full bay in to, you know, to activate the corners and really to provide the opportunity for a, um, a vibrant and a curated pedestrian experience all the way around this building, particularly along those two you know, major pedestrian corridors. 
the, the lobby is located in the center of the building, which again pushes the activity along Prospect Avenue into the corner, so we feel like that's really the, the, the right move. Um, so, you know, in terms of organization, the, the back of house is focused on the alley. We really tried to create, you know, create um, uh, activity and, uh, and retail focus along those, along those edges. As that translates into, you know, what that ground floor experience is, that, that ties into how we've designed the base of the building. Um, you know, we will employ, uh, you know, public realm enhancements that tie into planting, seating, paving patterns uh, at, at, at the ground plane. That carries up into the facade uh, in these, you know, in, in, in bays that are organized on a 33-foot rhythm to provide that, uh, that pedestrian scale at the base, offer a lot of transparency to allow you know, some of that activity in the building to bleed out and vice versa, um, and really provide some scalable elements to make that a comfortable pedestrian experience, canopies, signage bands, breaking down of the mass uh, at, that, at that human scale along the street. That's very important to us. That translates, uh, you know, we think into what will be a very, uh, you know, vibrant, active, and stimulating pedestrian experience, comfortable for the pedestrian. That's, that was the first goal. We've pulled back the massing at this side of the building to allow a little extra space on, on you know, what is a busy corner, and as we want to, you know, move people up the block towards uh, towards the transit station uh, and towards the and towards the building entrance, and give people the you know the opportunity to um, engage with the retail, circulate towards towards the transit, and and stop and have some areas where they where they could break out as well. Again, elements of the building that we could employ uh, are signage bands, canopies, you know uh, you know uh, metal elements that reference some of the uh, historic uh, steel shapes. To really, um, you know, to really break this facade down and provide a rhythm that we think is very uh, comfortable for the pedestrian scale. Looking back towards the square um, uh, north on Prospect Avenue, again, this experience, uh, you know, not only promotes, uh, you know, a comfortable pedestrian um, environment, um, but really, really sets up to frame some of the landmarks in the neighborhood, and that was very important to us. You know, we've, we heard a lot through the community process. Um, you know, the, the not blocking the view to the post office was, you know, was, was critical, and, and, and we agree. The way that the building steps back at that corner opens up that view to the post office, um, and we can also uh, highlight views to Prospect Hill Monument uh, as well as to the former to the former fire station. So, we, you know, we want this building to really be respectful to, uh, you know, what is special about Union Square and, and its landmarks. As we look to uh, to the upper levels, uh, each level is about 25,000 square feet. Just a little bit, just a little bit above that. Um, why we show this plan is because this is uh, important to us uh, in terms of our experience with commercial tenants. So high tech companies, research companies, um, you know, are all very interested in, in open, flexible uh, space. And this is the right size of floor plate, um, and, and we've designed it in such a way that it's very open and attractive to those types of companies. We want to set this up for success to get the right types of users in this building to, to really anchor this development. Um, that applies for in infrastructure as well throughout the building. Um, you know, we understand from our experience with, you know, with those types of uh, users, what's important to them, and, that, and that's all baked in here. So we feel like that's, you know, important to mention because um, that's, that's a goal of the project and a goal of this, of, of, of the master plan is really to have, you know, a strong, you know, commercial um, base in this building, 400 plus people, uh, 400 plus jobs, in this building, um, you know, innovation, ideas being exchanged, and we find this very, very stimulating. We feel like this can facilitate that type of that type of use. Looking at the elevation along Prospect Street, um, again, this is uh, th this was born from the idea of trying to create something, you know, modern in terms of its expression, but really referencing, uh, you know, the industrial vernacular, the historic vernacular, a building that has some order to it. Uh, we looked, uh, we. Um, looked very hard at providing a distinct expression of a base, middle, and a top. We feel like that's very important. The pedestrian zone at the, the base of the building has more transparency. The columns come down on this rhythm to, you know, to frame those storefronts. And that sets a strong base that's really tied into the pedestrian scale. As we look in the, you know, the middle portion of the building in its typical language, we've set up a hierarchy of uh, facade types that are consistent but work their way around the building. Um, and that have a very, a real vertical uh, emphasis. You know, we feel like there's something that ties into the idea of a historic, uh, you know, building that, you know, brings some of that verticality right down to the ground. 
Um, so, you know, we, we feel that that's a, a good response, and we've, we've switched that up a little bit on the corner because that to us is really the special moment of the building, facing back towards the plaza. That's where we introduce more glass, more transparency, and um, somewhat of a special moment there as, as the building uh, meets the sky on that corner to, you know, recognize how important it is, that relationship to, to the square. Um, we've also uh, broken the mass at the building entry. That was important <coughs> to provide a visual marker to, uh, you know, to, to announce that entry, but also to um, you know, mitigate the length of the building and have it feel comfortable from an urban scale as well as a pedestrian scale. Um, and then we also worked uh, very hard to step the upper levels of the building um, where we have uh, some mechanical equipment to facilitate the research use, um, stepped it to, to mitigate the building height and to provide a, a varied roofscape at the top of this building. Um, Again, we're, we're excited by this expression and we feel like it's, it's the right response for the site. Looking at it, you know, from, uh, from the plaza, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's an ordered building that, that expresses special moments, special moment at the entry. Really the most special moment is at the, is at the corner facing, facing the plaza. That's where we open it up and provide some more transparency. We, we allow the order to become a little bit more playful. <coughs> We open up an outdoor space at, at the top that, you know, again creates a special moment that looks back towards the towards the plaza. We understand that that wants to be a visual marker, uh, you know, in, in in the neighborhood given the site, um, but also you know very respectful of that plaza, and that's why we work very hard to step back those upper levels and to make some of these uh, changes at the, at the corner. Um, again, in the context of this being uh, the first commercial building in Union Square. Um, you know, great benefits associated with that that has been uh, identified throughout this process in terms of, um, you know, a million dollars a year in terms of uh, in commercial tax revenue, uh, 400 uh, plus permanent jobs, and that's what we're excited about in terms of you know, this new innovation economy and, um, you know, creativity and research and, and, and these exciting uses happen in the buildings. Um, 300 plus construction jobs as this building is built, which is very important. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, a million and a half dollars in housing linkage, uh, $228,000 in job linkage. So, you know, important for, for the community in that regard. Um, and then I think it's, you know, it's something that really kind of sets the commercial tone, uh, you know, for, for the rest of the development. So we're, we're, we're very excited to share it. Um, and we wanted to keep our presentation brief so that we could hear uh, community feedback. Thank you. The presentation in full. Is there more coming? Yeah. At, the, at the end in full? Yeah. Um, yeah. At the end. Okay. Does anybody um, on the board have any immediate questions for the applicant or for staff? No, 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 no. Yeah. no thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I am going to open it up for public testimony. I think we have a sign-in sheet that has already started to have folks fill out. Is that yes? Yep. Yep. Um, so I will start calling folks up as I see your names. Um, if your name is not on this list and you want to provide testimony, come on up after I've gotten through everybody. We've got a timer up there since there are a number of you in the audience. It's a two-minute timer tonight? Yeah. Okay. Two minute timer, when it's green, it's two minutes. When it's yellow, it's 30 seconds left. When it's red, I'll let you finish your, your thought um, and not cut you off too much. Okay? So, Hi. yes. I'm so sorry. This is my first time coming to one of these meetings. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is there a difference between providing testimony and comments on the presentation versus Q&A and asking questions of the presenter? Yes, there is a, there is a difference. Um, testimony is your thoughts and, and comments. Um, this is, your, your testimony generally helps guide some of our questions later. Um, you can't really ask, in, in this process, you can't just directly ask the applicant questions, but based on your testimony and your general thoughts and concerns, the applicant may come back and say, we've heard questions and concerns about this, let me address it. This isn't a, a back and forth. It's, these are generally my thoughts, and if you don't have Thoughts that are fully formed, that's totally fine. This is the first time a lot of folks are seeing this. Um, that's why we, at least, especially in this one, we'll have at least you know, several more opportunities for, for folks to see how it's changed or um, see how that lines up with what your thoughts and concerns are. That 
here. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Um, is the mic on? Yeah. Okay, great. There we go. Uh, Jack Thomas. Check out Williams. Yeah. May I start the other this? Yeah. Do you want to give me a shot that around? Sure, sure. Yeah. Hey, Jack, hold up one second. Thank you. Hello. Hold up one second. Um, <coughs> don't you really give this to me, Mike? I don't know if you want to see first if you have someone to be here. Uh, I'm happy to go after. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, my name is Jack Conley, lifetime resident of Somerville, uh, member of the Chamber of Commerce, homeowner, business owner, former elected official at the ward and citywide level. And together with hundreds of others, um, I work to uh, plan and build both the red and orange line uh, T stops currently existing here in the city. Uh, I've also had uh, uh, almost three years of experience working with uh, the transportation section of the initial summer vision plan. Uh, I'm here to represent not just myself, but literally hundreds of smaller businesses and thousands of residents who will benefit from the construction of this uh, type of life sciences building. And it is my fervent uh, desire to see that this building constructed obviously with recommendations from your planning staff and in concert with the Union Square Neighborhood Council who has been working to secure substantial community benefits for um, the Union Square Neighborhood. Ultimately, that will benefit the entire city. I endorse the approval of both the site and design plans for the building at D21 uh, as they will likely be conditioned by your own board as again in concert with the neighborhood. Remember that the city spent as obligated $50 million towards the construction of that Green Line T-Stop and this is only one small piece of what will be a remarkable transformation of Union Square as has been presently zoned. So I'd ask that you give careful consideration to the input of citizens, neighborhood council, and the entire community as the clock is currently ticking. I understand the Green Line station construction is somewhat pretty much right on schedule. We don't want to be seeing additional costs borne in order to play catch up. So with that, um, I will conclude my remarks and I'll certainly be watching and listening from friends and neighbors who I certainly will be offering opinions as well. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Board, members of the public. Uh, my name is Ben Ewan Campen. I'm the Ward 3 City Councilor, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, so first of all, everything I'm going to say is uh, premised on the fact that I want this to be a successful development, and that I, I just want to kind of set that tone. Um, so there's, there's two kind of issues that I just want to raise that I've been hearing a lot from constituents, and I'm sure all of you have too, over the last couple of years. The first has to do with the Community Benefits Agreement, which is of course not before you, it's not before any city body, but I just kind of want everyone here to be aware that that is something that is very much live and ongoing, and it, it really speaks to a lot of the issues that I know the neighborhood is concerned about. Small business displacement, the labor issues for the construction and permanent jobs, things that we can do additionally to mitigate the displacement. Uh, for housing and small businesses, green safe sustainability. So I think there is a lot of energy going into that because it is going to help bring some closure and finality to the issues that have been on people's minds. So I just want to raise that. And the other has to do with the design. So Director Proakis brought up the underground parking. And so I, I just want to kind of emphasize that throughout that timeline that was presented by the developer, where the, the, the premise of these neighborhood meetings and the design review committee has been to hear public feedback and professional feedback from the Design Review Committee. And I really can't overstate how strong my impression of the public feedback was that the possibilities that would be opened up by putting the parking underground to improve this and make this a more successful development really cannot be overstated. And I've heard a lot of pushback um, specifically around the cost. And in addition, I think some issues that might arise from an alternative design. Those I, I sort of leave to you. But in terms of the cost, I'm here tonight, I'm one city councilor, but I, I want to make very clear that 
while I might naively wish to say, oh, the developer should eat the cost, I would love that, I think that there is, there are solutions that involve the city, the developer, the community working together to figure out ways to help bridge that gap. And I just want to kind of publicly pledge that I'm very, very much willing to make that conversation happen. Um, so I just hope you keep in mind that should that be something that your board decides is important, I will certainly be a willing partner working on that on the city council. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from the public. Thank you. Please head on around. I don't know if anybody else wants to sign it or wants to come up with it, but um, you do have a second sheet. Uh, I may pronounce your name wrong, Jenna Schlager. Schlags. Bye. Um, apparently, I'm first. <laughs> do I go over to the. If you could, yes. Uh, I've lived in the Somerville area for all of a year now, and this is the first meeting I've come to because I really like living here. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I, I really have two questions to ask rather than comments, so I will ask them and uh, maybe the design team will think about them as they, they go forward in the process. Um, the, the first question is about accessibility. Um, in terms of attracting a diverse workforce um, and diverse customer base, uh, I was wondering um, how, if you could speak to the accessibility of both the commercial space that's on the bottom and also the office space. Um, and kind of along the lines of that um, and attracting both a, a younger and diverse workspace, um, considering things like gender neutral bathrooms or single stall bathrooms as part of the office space. Um, I know that's something that larger companies have been thinking about uh, in order to attract a diverse set of workers and um, that, you know, as a, a young lesbian in finance, that's something that is especially important to me when I look at companies. Um, and the other question is about uh, how you would plan to promote small business owners in the commercial space. Uh, Bow Market is right around the corner from me, and it's been really nice to see small business owners get the chance to have that space there. And I probably wouldn't visit so much if they were just a whole bunch of chains. Um, but knowing that things like, you know, a secondhand art supply store, um, uh, you know, that a small business owner who ha now has the opportunity to have a storefront rather than um, just selling online is something that makes me want to continue going there. Um, so I, I hope that's something that you guys will think about as you continue along in your planning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. I'm Jim McGinnis. I live at 26 Bow Street, uh, pretty much right in the square. I've been there for uh, how long? Almost 30 years now, and have been uh, involved and concerned with Union Square development for a long time. I can't tell you how pleased I am to see this proposal uh, get to this uh, uh, level. I think the commercial development of this sort, especially uh, uh, bio or high tech or other sorts of jobs of that sort, <coughs> is something that Somerville has needed. Uh, there are many people who have lived in Somerville that had to work in other towns. So, and, and I'm one of them. I've worked in a succession of, of uh, high tech startups. It's always been frustrating to have to go somewhere else in order to, to have work. Having said that, uh, I want to just emphasize my biggest concern about this entire plan. I'm not an architectural critic. I, I like the building. I think in many ways uh, it's pleasing and appropriate for the corner. But my concern has to do with the uh, uh, not precluding the possibility of underground parking as a way of improving the other portions of this um, uh, development block, the D2, uh, D2.2 and point three. And so uh, I, I really hope that um, uh, it's possible somehow to pursue both paths and, and make sure that uh, while the, the above ground portion of the building um, you know, may be refined somewhat as part of this process, that whatever happens that we not uh, uh, make it impossible 
to have uh, some or all of the parking underground. But, but other than that, I want to just uh, thank you all for the, uh, 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 a really nice and I think very well thought out uh, plan, and uh, I, I certainly endorse its uh, construction in a timely manner. Thank you. I just trying to make it down. Try to lower the window. Uh, no, 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 no. The sun, the, the, the shade itself. Thank you. I just wanted it to stop. Well, uh, Michael Katz, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm a resident uh, literally across the street from this building, uh, right behind the Dunkin' Donuts. I've been there for 35 years. Uh, I am overjoyed that we are moving. It's important that we're moving. There are issues, the underground uh, garage, certainly the idea of getting more green space is not something that any of us would be upset with, but I do, I'm concerned about um, pursuing affection, uh, perfection. Uh, I want to get this job done. I want to get, I want this to be open when we get the green line. Uh, I think that's a very important part of what's going on. Uh, won't matter to me, I'm going to be living in construction for the next 40 years if I make it that long. So uh, I just want to, I, I think that there's some very, very interesting things in what this is. Uh, there are still some things that we have to get, uh, including some way farther back a uh, elevator down from the south side to the, um, uh, to the train station. And that's all I need. Thank you very much. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Admittedly, I'm sorry, I was confused. I thought that was an attendance list and not a public comment sign up. Yes. So I'm good for it. Do you want to provide comment? You're more than welcome. I'm all good, thank you. Okay. Uh, Paula? Paula Masol? Yeah. Um, I'm doing everything. I also thought that was an attendance list, but I'm here to sign up. Why not? Hi, this is. Hi, um, good evening everyone. Um, I'm Paola Massoli. I live in East Somerville and I work in uh, Union Square. I am uh, one of the board members of the Union Square Council and uh, I um, couldn't agree more with pretty much everything that has been said so far, which I think is going to be a struggle for everybody having to make decisions because it's a lot of ideas and thoughts to accommodate, but I would like to um, stress the point that Jim has made um, of uh, trying to consider uh, the community input, um, the underground parking and the community benefit agreement that is still going has been brought up uh, by Councillor Ewan Campen. Um, those are all ongoing um, considerations that uh, I really appreciate you taking into account moving forward. Um, I also really like the building, it's great. I'm actually a research scientist, so I, I like seeing science buildings. I'm into summer build. But I, I also would want to have uh, as much as green open space and as much as uh, pedestrian access as possible. Um, the developer have, have stressed the um, idea of walkability, livability, you know, the agreement with the summer vision. So I think if this could be accommodated with a parking underground, that would leave a lot more space a lot more open quality space to the people uh, working in that area. So, um, and I think I'm on time, but uh, thank you for your time and uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jeff, eh? Jeff, Jeff, who was it? Jim Denis? Oh, I, oh I, I didn't. Uh, I, okay. I was just for the attendance. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I didn't grow to you. I thought you were laughing. Since when are you here? Seth Gray.
So hello, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Seth Grady and I'm with Union Square Partners. We're the owners of the former post office building. And so as the current owners of the building, uh, we uh, remain excited about the future prospects for the redevelopment of Union Square and the role that our property uh, will, might play in it. We look forward to preserving this important historic asset and converting it into a multi, or a vibrant multi-use venue that fits with the city's and the community's vision. Um, we believe in Union Square. Over the past few years, we've uh, witnessed the intensive community planning process evolve into a truly visionary neighborhood plan. Uh, in fact, the combination of strong city leadership, active community engagement, and a world-class master developer all influenced our decision to invest in Somerville and give us confidence in the future. Um, as we see it, the Union Square Revitalization Program has been making very steady progress over the past few years. Um, the proposed development of a new lab and office building at the D2 block is a major step in the right direction um, that is consistent with the neighborhood plan and promises to bring an early boost of employment and daytime demand for the many retail stores and restaurants in the neighborhood. Um, as we plan for the redevelopment of our building, we're looking for signs that other critical elements of the program are also moving forward. Um, we view the proposed new building as one of these signs, um, and we strongly support its development. Thank you. I also thought that was an intent to share. Did it say it? It doesn't say it. It does. I read, I read everything I sign. I'm, I'm a former resident of Somerville. I don't live here anymore. But I, I just want to say that I, when I lived here 35 years ago, the red line used to stop at Harvard in Cambridge. And I lived near um, Teal Square. I remember Davis Square. And I see what's happened to David Square. I mean, Ariel was the first Petucci's and the first things I school. And look at it now. And what I've heard earlier is, is with the timing of this, and what I'm hearing, which is very encouraging, is the urgency is to get this done and capitalize on the opportunity and the economic development, what it can do for this city. And I, I think the city should be commended starting back with summer vision going way back, 2002, in this this open, transparent process, and uh, I wish everybody much success. Thank you very much. Simon Hilders. Good evening. Can't do it in two minutes, but I'll try. That's the tail and take plan. Um, what I want you to imagine is that Union Square is over here and the idea is to create a better central area for this place in the future which is going to be so important to some of all as a whole as Union Square develops. Um, there was an idea to put four floors of parking under the lab building which seemed to come out fairly cheaply, um, so that's the relevance <coughs> to that. That's not what I want to talk about. Um, when this started off in, in the beginning, um, it didn't really matter who the developer was. I mean, it happened to be US too, but you had a poor mayor, you've got a poor city, and the poor mayor says, I need some money, because I, I need GLX contributions, infrastructure, a whole bunch of things. So US two, their estimate on this is about 30, 35 million. So they'll say, in good faith, we did what we were asked to do when we made promissory notes on this. The issue was that the city lost sight on what was happening with D2, almost as if they said, okay, thanks for the money, go ahead and do what you want. So D2 became this just building heavy project. Um, and when it went through the DRC committee, Frank Valdez literally said, look, we're reviewing glorified sidewalk when you look at the civic space on Prospect Street. Um, so imagine in the future that Prospect Street is going to have buildings down both sides of it. It's really, really narrow. It isn't that this is a better design, it's, which it is, with the underground parking, and the money for that can be found, as Councilor Ewan Campen was suggesting. Um, 
whether it's going to be as low as seven or as high as 16 million, this can come from contributions from US2, from the city, from other places to get it, because this is really, really important for the future to get this right. Um, but the planning board does need, in, in one sense, to take some blame for taking the eye off the ball on this one and, and just allowing a developer, it doesn't matter if it's this one or another one, to build such a building heavy model on D2, which has no decent civic space whatsoever, and to be stuck on Prospect Street, on that corner, in that civic space, it's gonna be a wind tunnel, it's gonna be noisy, it's gonna be smelly, and I don't wanna be there. So this is a foul up that you can help fix. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Again, we say the differences we get it all the time. <laughs> uh, Gary Trujillo. I also hadn't really intended on speaking, but um, I couldn't resist. Um, <clears throat> I agree with much of what Simon said, though uh, my style is somewhat different. Uh, but I think that it's not a matter, as one of the previous speakers said, of trying to achieve perfection. I think there are certain um, recurring feelings that I, I'm hearing within the Neighborhood Council, of, of which I'm a member and um, uh, also took part in the process by which the Neighborhood Council came into being. I've lived in Somerville for 35 years now. I've seen quite a lot of changes in that space of time. Um, but it's only recently that I've become aware of, of how these things are done. And I think we have an opportunity here to um, really engage with the citizenry to a greater extent than I have seen it being done with regard to objectives like getting underground parking which is, I, I understand that uh, underground parking is being provided in Boynton Yards just on the other side of the tracks and that the soil conditions are not that different. And also, um, this idea is not original with me, but um, $10 million is not that much, or even if it's 15 or 16 million, as compared to the 2 billion or so that it's gonna cost for the, for the whole thing. Uh, on D2. I live immediately adjacent to the D2 parcel on Allen Street, and the idea of having this, this big garage there doesn't really thrill me. Um, there are others here who, who could speak more explicitly to, to that matter. But uh, I would like to see some conversation uh, about these issues and, and to, to have a better feeling about how these things are happening. And, and if it turns out that what has been, has been presented tonight is, is the way to go, I want to feel convinced of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Someone changed this one to speak. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Tori Antonino. I live at 65 Boston Street. I'm an activist and on the board of Union Square and Neighborhood Council. Um, as has been mentioned, I really want to see thorough investigation and hopefully success at getting parking underground on this D2 parcel before moving ahead with this building. I think we can be creative. I think we can do it. I think, I think it's important to um, really make this as attractive and inviting and economically viable as possible. So hopefully we'll be able to thoroughly investigate and accomplish that. Um, on this particular building, I'm curious about what's up on top of it and what's beneath it. Um, 
with our zoning and in the CDSP, we didn't get quite as much as we wanted in terms of sustainability. And um, right now, as far as I know, that the top of that building is uh, a white membrane. And I'd, hopefully that is not true, but I'm here to advocate for green roofs. Um, green roofs uh, increase the value of a property. They've been known to last uh, three times longer as a normal roof. Um, they protect underlying structures from UV radiation um, and physical damage. And um, they're just, they are more inviting and um, they also attract tenants and will probably in, improve the uh, work of the people who of the people who work there. Um, and then underground, I'm pretty sure we're putting storm water tanks all throughout the um, Union Square. And I'm just here to question that because we need to get as much infiltration as possible. And I know this is a flood prone area, but I want to make sure that if we can get as much storm water processing on site, that is something I'd like to hold US 2 to, because I think we can do it, and it'll be a great example of what Union Square can do. I've been writing notes. It's easier. Yes, I'm Joe Beckman. I've lived in Union Square since 1991, having escaped Cambridge. Um, my concern for simple items. One is I'm concerned how we, how a seven. Microphone. Am I talking close up to it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. First, I'm concerned about how a seven-story building can be built adjacent to a subway station, adjacent to a bridge, with no elevator. It's a seven-story building, it's got to have an elevator someplace, and why can't it stop down in the basement? <clears throat> I'm 75 years old, and I'm fat, and I need a way to get there. Uh, I respect the developer's concern with the views of the post office and the views of Prospect Hill, but I wonder how those views can be maintained without an underground garage. They don't seem to be feasible now in that design. What I see instead is a, is, is a three-story three brick garage surrounded by what I consider a Trump wall. And I don't think a wall is a very inviting, inviting entry to Union Square from a, from a subway. And then I wonder, with a contingency budget, which I've heard is up to $300 million, how a $10 million, maybe $15 million underground garage can even be considered a risk. It's less than 1%. And most budgets really are much tighter than that. And then finally, I wonder how the Cambridge City Council can be considering can be considering a a uh, home a, a suit for disability access, and Somerville can't. It's astounding that Cambridge is more aggressive than Somerville. Is. They're only contributing half of what we're contributing, and yet they realize that they have status and they have power and they and they can use it. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Watt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Rachel Weil. I'm a member of the Union Square Neighborhood Council and a resident of Concord Avenue in Union Square. The Union Square community has rallied behind an alternative design for the D2 parcel, one championed in the Talon and Tate Charette, which reflects the community desire for more quality open space, connectivity between the T and Union Square Plaza, and underground parking. 
I feel that the planning board should not move forward on making a, res a recommendation for D2.1 until an alternative design for the entire parcel is put forward with those considerations included and the community benefits agreement has advanced. This ask uh, was supported by the city council last week as they unanimously approved an order that the OSPCD uh, actively support the community-led alternative design. Community input on meaningful green and open space in the parking structure in D2 uh, have been ongoing. A week ago, we had an update on the community benefits agreement negotiations that brought together a broad swath of community members with a wide range of concerns, including lab dissatisfaction on the D2 design as it stands. The city council voted on the order the next day uh, to support that alternative design or an alternative design. Clearly, the consideration of an alternative design is necessary. <coughs> Approval of D2.1 would preclude the inclusion of important facets of the community-led alternative design, such as underground parking. Uh, while the community understands that the time and cost constraints on this project are real, it is too important and too tied to the community to fast track from this point on. I do not recommend the board move forward until an alternative community-led design for D2 be diligently incorporated. Thank you. Thank you. Lady Greenspons. My name is Andy Greenspun. I'm a board member of the Union Square Neighborhood Council, and I've been working advocating on this process in Union Square since I moved here almost six years ago. I think almost everyone supports in the abstract a commercial building for the important city tax revenue and to generate more daytime population in the square for local business. Um, at the coordinated development special permit meetings in December 2017, when it was approved, despite immense critique and concerns for the, uh, from the community, the planning board stated that the CDSP didn't need more detail because that would be included in this process, the design and site plan review process. I reference a Somerville Times article from right after that, which I encourage all the planning board members to read if they haven't, and I'll quote a tiny section. Planning board chairman Kevin Pryor insisted that after years of Union Square discussion and planning, it was time to vote. But the planning board has a responsibility to evaluate whether what is being proposed is consistent with the plans and regulations which embody the community's shared wisdom and vision for the future. Decisions should be made based on this, not a desire for expediency. If D2.1 is approved as is, it basically locks in the rest of the D2 design beyond perhaps minor tweaks that won't really be able to take into account future community feedback for those parts. The alternative design, as has been referenced, that was made by Tim Talon and Ann Tate was proposed last summer. US2 has done nothing with it, claiming this $10 million cost but they haven't even approached sketching their own version of this design or any middle ground alternative that could be feasible for them or could be feasible. If US2 were flexible and the community clearly supports it, an alternative design could be approved fairly quickly. This new development process with the CDSP was designed to be an iterative process where designs would be flexible and change based on community input. I believe US2 has not in fact taken into account all the input in the numerous neighborhood meetings where these uh, issues have been brought up repeatedly. D2 is arguably the most important part of the development plan, being the first, being right near the center of the square, and being the thing people will see when they walk to and get off of the Green Line Station. I want this development done, but I want it done it right. I want it done with actual immense community feedback being incorporated. If US2 were required to improve it and got actual community feedback, I think it could be done very quickly. The Green Line Station will be built no matter what. The potential that will exist for decades to centuries won't be hurt by a slight delay to improve the design, but the design that gets built will affect the community for years to decades to a century to come. That is the long-term design impact, and I believe that is what this board is empowered to address. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, you asked. Oh, Well, Wiggs Haymore, 13 Highland Avenue. Um, I agree pretty much with everything that's been said so far tonight, including the importance of economic development and new permanent jobs here. Um, I also am very concerned about the lack of uh, solution to the garage problem on the D2 block, and uh, do believe that we could add enough square feet to this development to fully cover the cost of that at $100 per FAR square foot. 
Um, whether it's $10 million or $15 million increment, you're talking 100,000 or 150,000 square feet somewhere in the whole US2 development. That's not a whole lot. And you could also get the elevator for $2, $2 million to get from Prospect down to the platform. Incredibly important for the, for the long term. The open space in all of our large, large developments is not consistent with summer vision. We are, we are planning and building about one third of the open space that is the legal plan for this city, its zoning and its planning decisions. And we are not doing that. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is that uh, the garage all along the alley, which I know we're not really talking about the alley tonight, but precluding underground uh, storage under this office building or lab building that we are talking about is part and parcel with having that alley, which will forever block Allen Street from incorporation into the plans for Union Square. Our proposed zoning citywide in Union Square has a high-rise district completely surrounding Allen, Linden, Miriam, and Charlestown Street, and then also blocks them and, and has a three-story garage. So those people, are not going to have valuable properties to sell at some time in, in the future, and the community will be lacking the ability to have integrated plan across the district, which could just be mixed income housing with a, a lot more housing than is there now, and it could be much greener, it could be much uh, less energy intensive, and it could have a lot of affordable housing in the future as well as market rate. But we are completely blocking that with this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members, members of the committee. My name is Stephen Mackey. I'm with the Somerville Chamber of Commerce, 2 Alpine Street. Um, as always, there is wonderful participation by the community and uh, so many perspectives offered uh, to you, the decision-making uh, body in this case. Um, and I think there are two things that need to be remembered after everything is said, and that is at least two things, that um, it's about figuring out the balance of all the interests of the commercial space, the open space, the housing space, et cetera, et cetera. And it's about prudence. You know, the most densely populated city in New England, you've had one of the lowest commercial tax bases. 20 years ago, we said, if you want to meet citizen expectations, you need to develop uh, a commercial tax base. You need to get transit in order to develop that tax base. Now, here we are. This building, you can see a lot of things when you look at it, seven stories, 400 jobs, millions in taxes. Um, you see the multiplier effect. Uh, bull market will thrive, the storefronts will thrive. Uh, the post office will thrive uh, with uh, what's generated from that building. Um, we need to be in the ground. Uh, the, the green line's in the ground. We need to get in the ground. We look forward to the, um, the recommendation by the staff, and we hope that the planning board will be able to grapple with all of the issues that there always are with any single proposal. Uh, we always want them to solve all the problems. This one gets us, uh, it puts a stake in the ground about solving all the problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anybody else that wants to provide testimony on this project, I want to be here. Hi, I'm Kathy Gregory. Uh, I live at 76 Berkeley Street and have been here for about 20 years. I like a lot of what the architect has done, but I have to say that I'm very disappointed that it's a box. Um, Somerville and Union Square in particular has so many artists and so many musicians and such an incredibly <coughs> creative spirit. And when you look at this building, it could be an assembly square, it could be just about anywhere, and I'm disappointed that I don't see something that's got some 
a little, it doesn't have to be a quirky, Frankiri kind of experience, but it needs to be when you're coming down Prospect Street and you see Union Square, you know that you're there. This could be anywhere. And also when you're coming down Prospect Street, it's a gateway. It's sort of the entry to our little area here. And I think it needs to express that both in terms of architecture and, and perhaps um, doing some color or a sculpture on the roof or just something that sort of not only says that you're there but is welcoming. To me, looking at a box is not welcoming. I think a lot of good stuff is here. I love the, the pedestrian activity. I like the transparency. But it's very cold and it's very rigid and linear. And I would just like to encourage the architects to sort of open up a little bit and see if something warmer and more welcoming could be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else that wants to provide testimony before I close this evening? At least oral testimony. Okay, at that point, I'm going to close this portion of the public hearing. Um, and open it up to members of the planning board who have any questions or thoughts for the applicant uh, before staff move forward in drafting a recommendation for us hopefully by a couple of weeks um, so that they might be able to work with the applicant to um, get a report that incorporates some of what we've heard and also any of the concerns of the members of the board tonight. Mr. Chief. Yes. I can tell you, at first glance, you know, I like the way it looks. But having said that, uh, let me just go back to my notes. Was it uh, one of the speakers uh, came up and, and quoted Kevin Pryor about, uh, you know, it was time to vote. And uh, as one of the members who voted, it was time to vote at that time. But we voted on a framework. Uh, that's, and we said at that point is that once the framework was in place, as in each and every project comes forward, that's when we now have our opportunity to deal with the, the foundation. And that's the foundation of Union Square. So, so with that, and uh, you know, I heard many a positive statement tonight, and uh, you know, I want to join in on those positive statements. But I also you know, want, you know, I heard the councilor from Ward 3 also talk about, you know, uh, talking about working with the city, with the developer, to find a way to get it done. That has been my philosophy in any aspect of government, is to, to find a way to get to yes. So, I mean, I really want to see staff uh, work all sides of this to find a, a plan that includes, you know, less, no garage, and has an underground. I mean, I think that's critical. I think I heard that from at least six out of, one out of every two or three out of every four people who spoke. I mean, I'll tell you, a vote I took in this room many, many years ago now is that uh, was at Assembly Square as part of Partners. And uh, I'm going to board it hell out of here, but uh, my wife and I, I live in East Sound, we walk down the body way down into Assembly Square, and we walk, and we walk, and we walk, and we walk past that garage. And I remember uh, when uh, uh, Zig always basically said, that's the biggest garage, I think, in all of greater Boston. So I don't want that to be the legacy of the first project that we put in the ground at Union Square. So, I mean, I, I appreciate all the work of the developer, I appreciate the work of the city, but I think we need to put everyone together and find a better solution uh, for, for a basically signature first project out of Union Square. I get the economic development is critical. I know all the commitments we've made, but we want to get it right as well. Thanks, John. Yes. Um, I would agree with Joe wholeheartedly. Um, the building, um, I think it, it looks okay. I'd like to um, give more thought to that, but I am concerned about some of the things that I heard from the 
Union Square members tonight and the uh, <coughs> people involved about uh, the underground parking and also the elevator. I, I can't even imagine that the elevator wouldn't be a crucial part of this development. I think that has to happen. But then I heard you make, make a statement about uh, a whole neighborhood being excluded and sort of walled off. And that's concerning to me. If there was any way that we could get around that. I was, uh, in fact, during my administration, we built Linden Street. And we built it like a neighborhood. And to think that it wouldn't remain that way in today's world, it would be, uh, I'd be sad about that because I know that neighborhood very well. Walked it, talked it for two years before we built that project down. So I'd like to think that it remained open to everybody. So I think there are things that can be done working with everybody involved. I know underground parking is extremely expensive. I've been involved in my other life uh, with those kind of issues. But, uh, and I worry a little bit about underground parking in Union Square, to be quite honest with you, because um, I was, in 1996, I think, we had a major flood in Union Square. And I have to be sure that we took every, uh, how shall I say it, every precaution that we wouldn't ever end up like that again because our fire station was flooded, all of the, the um, areas in Union Square and the plaza itself were underwater. So, you know, they say they, those floods only happen every hundred years, but I think we can forget that in, in uh, today's climate <coughs> change, it's happening a lot more frequently. But there are issues, but I don't think they're unsurmountable. I've heard a lot more issues with building, but these, with different construction, but these are issues I think that mean an awful lot to the community. And where it is such a close-knit community and so dense, I think we have to look at all these issues one by one and come up with the best solution possible. It may not be to everybody's liking, but I think people need to have feel that they were listened to and they were heard and the best compromise possible. Because it is important to have this building, the first building in Union Square, to be correct and something that we can all be proud of. And uh, it's going to be there for a long time to come. And we're being looked at by the rest of the country about what's happening in Union Square. I was in New York recently at a, an event and somebody asked me about Union Square. I thought they were talking about New York. I said, <laughs> uh, it's uh, Somerville. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting place to be. And with the tea and everything that we have done, and we've done well, we need to do this well. That's how I feel. And I think with us all working together, and then I think it can happen if government, the community, and the developers work together. It doesn't have to be all on the developer. And I want to thank them for the effort they have made so far. And I think we're not done yet. That's my opinion. Sure. Um, thank you for the input we've received tonight. I think that I agree with my colleagues' characterizations and the feedback we've received and, and the developers' work to date to incorporate some community feedback from the earlier stages of the process and the idea that we still have um, probably some distance to go to close this up in a solution that will um, be the best for the community here. It sounds like there's a broad consensus building to sort of deeply explore underground parking and I um, find one of the most persuasive elements of that comment not to be so much about the reduction of the above ground parking but about the ability that that would open up to include more civic space. Um, I've heard a lot of the discussion about the demands for civic space and open space and the ongoing planning from Somerville 20, 2030 as well as the 2040 planning process about the cost that the city is considering um, for the acquisition of additional open space and how we can maintain that as we, um, as we become a more dense city than we are already and uh, look to preserve some areas where we still have that opportunity. And I would ask the staff to consider, um, especially in light of the funding structures and um, costs that we are looking at already in the open space planning, how we might um, dovetail that effort with some of the explorations of the underground parking here. Um, 
I have a number of more detailed comments about the building itself, but I defer to the chairman on whether we want to wait to a later can, date for those. You, you can make them tonight, or, um, or you can make them now. Um, one of the comments that I was prepared to come with tonight was raised uh, by a number of the community who spoke, which was, uh, I know it seems basic, but the inclusion of um, inclusionary restrooms or gender neutral restrooms. I don't see those reflected in the building core. I also don't see um, mother's rooms reflected in the building core and in the interest of making this a, a welcoming place to a broad cross-section of the community for both office and lab workers. I'd be interested in hearing about the thought process that went into not including either of those in the farm spaces. Um, and also, I, I'm led to believe that the structure of the building uh, relies primarily on Elevator access, even for the lower floors, and I, I have not explored the interior plans that are available, but would wonder if um, in an era of trying to be more energy efficient and promote physical activity, whether stairways to the um, lower floors of the building that are not simply uh, exit stairs might be considered or incorporated into the design. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my thoughts have been uh, already said by, by my, my colleagues um, and by many of, of you. The next time this is before us, whether it's in a couple of weeks or, 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 or four weeks, uh, I really want to see a couple of things incorporated either as a proposal to see whether you know, how feasible it is or this is simply not feasible and I want a reason why. The underground parking and the elevator. Um, we've heard it from everyone on this board, and we've heard it from most of the folks um, who spoke. Joe's right. The partner's garage is big, massive. It is on the back side of assembly. Uh, this isn't. This is right there. This is you walk right by it. Everybody's going to see it. It's not a welcoming sight when you walk out of the green line. I'd like to minimize the impact of that as much as I can um, to open up the Prospect Street car. My first two thoughts, which were shared by a, by a lot of people, um, was, first of all, where the heck is the civic space? I understand that there's going to be a strip along Prospect that might be considered open space. Um, there's, there's nothing here. I, I don't see any setbacks on, on the facade to open up the building at all to the street. Uh, I don't see anything that would open it up at all with the exception of adding some additional glass on the corner into the main area of the heart of Union Square to make it more inviting to people. I don't see any sort of a courtyard, uh, whether it's interior or even just an <coughs> entry foyer at all. Um, all I see are four big walls uh, that, that has, to me, no inviting entrance. Um, it took me a couple of tries to figure out where the heck the front door was in this building. I, I, um, there, are, there are better ways of inviting people into this building, both for the retail space as well as the, the office and potential lab space up top. Um, and that, you know, whether that's going to be open civic space in the form of an atrium or something like that with uh, green walls and plantings and hangings or, so, or something to make it green and inviting and welcoming, um, or whether it's more than just the street trees. There's, there, there's nothing here, it's, it's, it's kind of barren. Um, I was hoping to see something for the heart of Union Square that would be an inviting building and the glass and steel is is one way of doing it but it's certainly not uh, enough to me at least. Um, and the second concern is why does it look like a big box? I have no problem with the height. I think it's what seven, seven stories or so. Um, the height is fine. When you've got this building built up, when you've got the D6 building built up, when you've got the D1.1 building built up, and you're in the Union Square Plaza, it's going to feel like you're surrounded by these massive facades, these massive buildings, and you're in a chasm. I understand you'll have some back space going back towards, uh, towards the post office, but when you look down Prospect Street, it's going to be I think visually overwhelming for anybody that's not already in one of these buildings. I think it's, I think the massing of the building, if you can push it back from the lock lines a little bit, 
uh, and, and reduce the floor plan a little bit just to give the exterior a little bit more street use. Uh, that's, that's one consideration. Uh, if that can't be done, if some of the top floors can at least be stepped back a little bit so it doesn't look like a monolith, uh, that's another way of doing it, I would, I would hope. I understand it goes up that way as you get up towards the penthouse, uh, but that's not the way it looks for the, for the first seven uh, actual musical stories. And the last thing, the visual thing for me, that what was the building that had the crazy windows that Rebecca and I were going nuts about the other week? Do you guys remember? 315 Broadway. Right was it 315? I don't mind the look of the steel and the glass. I think it's nice. I think it is modern. Um, I, I tend to like more traditional looking buildings, but this is not a bad looking modern building with, uh, you know, with, with, with some historic um, homage as, as, as your developer uh, and your presenter said. Um, can we go back? I don't know if you guys can go <coughs> back to the, 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 the photo of the side of the building that's on the Rosbent Street. Yeah, I think that was the one you just had. Yeah, this one. The windows don't line up. It's a silly thing to say, but it looks it looks a little disjointed. I understand it might be you know, funky and modern, but I think when you see this, is that the Prospect Street side? Yeah. Um, I think it just looks a little a little jumbled, like, like somebody just didn't line the windows up right. And from what I understand, the same is going to be true for the other buildings going down Prospect Street. It's going to be this jumbled, misaligned window. Look. Um, I don't think it looks cohesive. I think it looks like it's intentionally trying to be um, And you know, I have too many kind of the independent walk down Prospect Street, look at these windows, and be this. Um, is there a way to clean up this facade and make it look a little bit more traditional, a little less like that weird MIT building that they built a few years ago? <laughs> Um, I, I believe in the No, no. no. Okay. Um, Rebecca is an architect, and Rebecca has the technical terms for things I'm trying to say. <laughs> and I'm waiting for her to come in and correct what I'm trying to say, because I, I, I think at least on these window things, uh, she and I agree, and, and she might be able to verbalize some of my concerns. Um, with a more uh, technical speak, but generally I like the building, generally I like the concept of, of where you are, I think there needs to be more work, um, I think we all agree that there needs to be modifications done, some that I think are, are easier to do than others. Um, with the parking and with the elevator, I want to see uh, plausibility, I want to see cost, I want to see um, how the city thinks it can work with you to, to make sure that's done because it's clearly important to the neighborhood. Um, it's important to, to me as well um, to open up, especially that back side, to make it more usable so it's not necessarily just a, a garage and a wall. Um, I don't want to make that mistake on an actually usable car wall. So that's that's kind of how, how we stand. I don't, I don't think we were too hot. I, I, you guys know we're trying to make the best building forward and I, I, I always hate feeling like I'm yelling at you guys when you're trying to do the right thing because I think you have tried to do the right thing and I, I, I'd like to see you continue to do that. Do um, you have anything from the staff? Do you guys want to add anything? A reminder about the written comment period. Yep. The 19th. Uh, yep. We're going to hold the written comment period open until the 19th. Um, and by the way, if uh, I'll remind you all again, if plans change substantially such that we reopen this for public testimony, uh, you will have more of an opportunity to speak and to provide written testimony so we can make sure that this building gets uh, where it needs to be. Because yes, this is one development, this is one building, but we all know that it is part of a much 
bigger and, and, and more cohesive plan that we want to make sure that each component part um, is as best as it can be, both individually and as part of a larger development. So, uh, if there's anything else on on this project, we look forward to seeing you, um, or at least the staff plan um, on the 18th. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of your written testimony that we will be keeping open until noon on the 19th. Uh, that is the last piece that the planning board has. We do have one additional piece of additional business. Uh, which is not a case, it is just other business, and it's a discussion of the 2040 uh, Summer Vision Committee that we have been kind of kicking until uh, the committee got uh, approved, but I'm going to hold off on that until uh, next meeting when hopefully we have a full contingent of planning board members so we can have a full discussion on it. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the meeting? Uh, May I ask yeah, absolutely. Um, I am, I, prior to my appointment to the board, have been serving on the Senate Vision Committee and am seeking the board's approval to Wind up. attend as a member of the planning board at the Second. Summer Vision Conference that is happening. Second by Joseph. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You were on the committee. Congratulations. <laughs> Go forth and do good. I thought I might make it easy for you. You did. You did. She's uh, in life uh, with it. <laughs> Jam moves to adjourn and go home. Good night, everybody.